I remember around fifth or sixth grade, every single morning, to my recollection, I woke up with this undercurrent of anxiety, of dread. Words that I would now use would be this sense of imposter syndrome, this sense that I was at some point going to be found out. I wasn't worried about the kinds of things and the kinds of ways that anxiety normally presents itself, especially in young children. I wasn't worried about any kind of global pandemic. I wasn't worried about war. I wasn't worried about my parents separating. I was, separating. I was worried about being found out and somehow being excluded from the tribe of not belonging, of not being enough. And those thoughts and those feelings, those paradoxical stories that were writing the reality of my life were making my inner world nearly untenable. And this went on for years. But I kept doing my best. I kept learning as much as I could. I kept working towards being the best version of myself I could possibly be. And then a lot of bad things started happening in my life, one after the next after the next. And it didn't feel fair. Within the space of just two years, I buried my brother my very best friend, my confidant, the person outside of my husband with whom I had the most intimate connection of anyone else on the earth. Very shortly thereafter, I buried my little boy, my brother's namesake, and those two gallons are buried just up the road in the old Black Man Cemetery. This all happened around the time of the economic collapse and the housing crisis. And we were in a lot of financial trouble. We were recycling cans in order to have enough money to pay for gas so that Richie could make it to the various meetings that he had across the island. We were subsisting on spaghetti for every meal. There was a lot that was going on. And I, I sat and I thought about it and I thought, I don't deserve this. I've done all the things. I'm worthy of a different world than this one that is completely spinning out of control. But something happened in the course of those crises that fundamentally changed my story that broke that paradox and that gave me the space to see clearly and to navigate the world through clear eyes. It was as our son was dying, in those very last moments of his life, in the pediatric intensive care unit, and up until the very last moment, I did not believe that my boy was going to die. I had all the faith in the world that there was no way that boy was going to leave us. I had just lost my brother. It seems like I'd reached some kind of quota, especially because I did all the right things. I didn't deserve this hardship. It wasn't fair. And then all of a sudden, I found myself sitting in a rocking chair holding my little boy while my husband knelt on the floor in front of me with his hand on our son's heart, feeling for the last beats. And I sang him a lullaby. And I felt that moment when his spirit was no longer present, when all I was holding was this flesh, flesh of my flesh, with no life within it. And I sat there and I thought, how in the world do I move forward from here? 
not just in a general sense, but in an actual, immediate, actionable way, how do I move from this moment to whatever moment comes next? Because this is an actually impossible thing. And in my worst nightmares, I may have imagined the death of a loved one or the hardship of saying goodbye to someone that I loved, but I never thought of the practicality of what moments like that would look and feel like. At some point, I knew I had to stand up and lay my little boy down on a hospital bed and walk out of that building. And I didn't know how to do it. And I remember vividly shutting my eyes and screaming inside my head. How? How? And in that moment, a very unique thing happened. And it's something that's very difficult to put into words, but I will do my best. In that moment, I experienced a sense of myself unlike anything I had ever known before. I was not Natalie Norton, who was born in 1981 and was sitting in a hospital room with her dead child in 2010. But I was this, this energy, this spirit that had existed for eons before and would exist for eons after and was connected to and a part of the life and the energy that lived within every human soul. And that with that collective power and that collective worth and value, with a knowledge of that, a visceral knowledge of that, one that I could feel coursing through my entire body, I did the impossible thing. And I stood up out of that rocking chair and I started to look around the room. Because the only logical thing I could think of was to set him back on that cold, sterile hospital bed. And I just, I couldn't do it. And then, out of the corner of the room, up walks this young girl. And I hadn't even noticed that she was there. She could not have been more than 21, maybe 22 years old. She was a nurse or potentially even like a volunteer. I'm not exactly sure. But she looked me in the eyes. And what I remember, I don't know her name. I don't know anything about her. But I remember looking into those crystal clear blue eyes that were brimming with tears and knowing that she was bearing witness to my pain. She was standing in that space with me in that moment that our consciousnesses were completely intertwined and we were connected in a way that I don't know how to describe. And she looked at me and her lips quivered and she said, would you like me to rock him for you? I'd love to rock him for you. And so rather than putting my little boy down on that big cold sterile bed, I was able to hand him to this sister that I had never met and will never see again and watch her look at him with so much love and watch her cradle him against her own chest and kiss his forehead and hum him a lullaby and rock him back and forth. While I walked out of the room, walked out of the hospital, I moved forward with my life. She carried me there. She showed up for me there. Even though she was clearly scared, she was clearly uncomfortable. I mean, that is a quite intimate moment. And yet, rather than sitting there wondering, gosh, I wish I could help, 
She offered herself to me. She made an offering of her own love, of her own soul, and confirmed for me that sense of interconnectedness, that sense of value and worth, and that changed my story forever. I actually wrote something on the way here. <laughs> so it's not memorized. And like my husband said, I, I had a stroke in um, 2016. And ever since then, I have a really hard time memorizing things. So I apologize. I'm going to read this to you. Um, we all have these stories, right, that guide and direct and inform our lives. And whatever that story looks like for you, wherever it comes from, whatever story you have embodied, and maybe it's a combination of a few, what I hope to convince you of today is that that story says that you are made of magic and stardust and whatever magnificent, omnipotent force breathed you into being or banged you into becoming, that energy, that essence, that mana, that spiritual energy is coded in your actual DNA. That atom, that floating particle of energy that woke up one morning and had the actual audacity to split itself in two is a part of your lineage, your heritage, your family tree. That same courage, that same magic, that same stardust, that same audacity to wake up and say, I can create from the very essence of who I inherently am, oceans and plankton and vegetation and boys and girls and rainbows and taxi cabs and fingers and toes and Kardashians and poetry, and kindness, and Beyonce, and Buddha, and Mohammed, and Jesus Christ. It's that courage. It's that magical stardust. It's that fantastic audacity that courses through your veins. That causes that beat, beat, beating of your own beautiful heart. One more story and I'll close. There's another narrative that again changed my life. The story I used to tell myself was that the more you learned, the more you know, right? And I think a lot of you are college students, so you're probably hoping, yeah, the more I learn, kind of hoping that'll mean that I know more. But the reality is, for me, and especially after experiencing that cluster of traumas that was the loss of my brother, the loss of our son, great financial devastation, followed by our failed adoption. After two years of uninterrupted custody, being told from the beginning that under no circumstances would this adoption fail, that under no circumstances would these children be reunified with their biological mother. And then getting a phone call on a Thursday evening when I'm out of town giving a speech in California, and I'm told, hey, your kids are going back to their mom tomorrow morning. And we fall into my knees and weeping and begging and pleading, just let them say goodbye. And then suffering from the TIA, transient ischemic attack, which is basically a mini stroke, in which I did lose a lot of my mental capacity, which again exasperated those tendencies towards depression and anxiety that I've already been, I don't like using the word struggled with, but um, navigating since my early childhood. 
And then my, my little Lincoln, getting a phone call while I'm shopping at Target that my little boy was hit by a car and he's in the intensive care unit at Queens Hospital in the trauma center and that I better get there quick. Life is full, full of challenges. But they have nothing to do with our value, nothing to do with our worth, nothing to do with our merit or our lack thereof. It's just life. And the story, the narrative, that everything happens for a reason, I don't know if I actually believe that. But I will say that one of the most common messages that I receive from people on Instagram or via email or people who are inspired by our story and our, our tenacity and our grit, and these are all the words that they use, they're always reminding me that the cracks are where the light gets in. Right? The cracks are how the light gets in. But going back, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. I remember the first time I had to go and do really grown-up things after my son died. And one of those things was going to Costco. And I remember walking through Costco, looking at all of these people and realizing that they had no idea how much pain I was in. They had no idea that my emotional anguish was so great that my skin was raw, that the wind touching my skin as I walked through that warehouse burned, that every piece of me was grieving my little boy, and that every time I walked past an empty crate space, all I wanted to do was crawl inside and get as small as I could and hide because I hurt so much. And then I looked around and I realized nobody knows that about me. What don't I know about all of you? And if all of us truly are connected by that same energy, that same mana, that same light, that same divine, energetic, creative power, how can we better show up for one another, knowing that we don't know what we don't know, and the, the more we know, the more we know we don't know. And what I've learned, yes, the cracks are where the light comes in, but the cracks are also where the light gets out. And what would happen if each of us chose to show up differently, to take a full sense of responsibility for our capacity to love and share and connect and treat every single person like we don't know? What would happen if we let go of all the outrage and stop itemizing all the ways that we're different and instead started identifying with all the ways that we are the same? How might that change the way that we interacted with one another? The way that we showed up every day in the world and the way that we let those cracks form our heart into something bright where that inherent light, that mana, that energy, that love out into the world all around us. My friends, challenge your narratives, challenge your stories. When you look at the things in your life that seem all-encompassing and impossible to overcome, my challenge to you is to dig deep and don't ask why me, ask what next. Ask how can I behave and show up for this? How can I assign why? And when I do, how can I then live differently and more wholeheartedly as a result? Thank you.